up my meter. All right, so we talked about this at length in class uh, last week on Zoom. But now what is it like seeing it, right? When we're in class, it's we're on the little thumbnail on a Zoom screen, and you don't get the magnitude of this, uh, what we call scale. So, and the only way you can take tell the scale of something is if you have recognizable images around it. So like, look at the palm tree, right? The palm tree, we know that a palm tree is pretty tall, right? We just, we inherently know that. And that palm tree is almost the height of this wall, which tells us we're pretty high up. So when you take your photos, I want you to try to include that palm tree if you can, because when you're writing about this paper two weeks or three weeks later from now, because that's what you all will do. You'll wait till the last minute to write your paper, and that's okay if it works for you. But I know Kim won't, because Kim's, Kim's he's, he's, um, yeah. Yeah, he's an AV guy. And, uh, hi, Jiong. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so when you're writing about your paper, this conversation that we're having right now, you're gonna remember the tree, and hopefully it'll trigger, oh, that, that gives me the sense of scale, okay? so. That is what you use outside images for. When we're in a museum, we do things like our, our physical body. How does something relate to you? So if you're looking at a gigantic painting, you relate it to like how high are you looking up, how wide is it, things like that. But when we're talking about murals, the things that are tricky are focal point, and we're gonna talk about that. Like where is our point of view? Where has the artist placed us? Does everyone remember the three Focal points that there are there three point of views that there were. Foreground, middle ground. Nope. Oh, nope. Okay. That's when you're talking about the composition. Oh. I want to. I want to know like where the artist places us. Remember that video we watched? Oh yeah, it was the uh, bird. Eye. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Bird's eye, worm's eye, and head on. You also remember. We learned that when an artist wants us to be involved in the image, they crop it, right? How many of you post something on social media? And you have, like me, I record something, and I'm really far off in the distance, but I want to I stand out. I crop, and so where I get bigger and bigger, right? And now I'm the most important figure in that image. Artists do the same thing. They, when it's something that they want you to pay attention to, they will crop the image to get you right into the story, into the narrative, into the subject right away, okay? The title of this is The Bond, okay? And I talked about what this represents, right? It, it represents the children that were being separated from their caregivers, the adults that were bringing them to the border, and, and they were being put in the cages with those silver blankets, and we all watched it on the news in 2018, the year that he created it is right to the left with his signature. And it devastated this artist, multiple artists that were here painting that year. So this was in 2018. This artist, Case McCain, he's from Germany, and he comes here to paint for this festival where we're supposed to have a really good time and really rejoice as a community and this is in the news and everyone's talking about it and he just can't shake it so he decided to do that story as his subject matter okay so we have a story and that story plays out in the subject matter and the artist brings us into the composition either intimately or as a bystander as a spectator right we're either observing it or we're involved in it he wants us to get involved. And he does that right away by cropping the image and making us come into the composition and try to figure out what's going on, okay? I know the story, and a lot of people that look at this mural may not. So that's why art is whatever you make of it. It is yours. It's yours to decipher, it's yours to put your own narrative onto it, it's yours to like it or dislike it, it's yours, right? An artist is giving a fixed image. We don't have a movie where we've got a beginning and a middle and an end that we are watching play out or a book that we're reading. We have just a still image that has to tell an entire message. And how artists do that is the first and foremost is where they put you as the viewer, okay? 
something is gigantic, you know, they oftentimes get to pick their walls. So they can get all this information about the wall and say, I, I really don't want to paint there. I want my composition to be tall and narrow, or I want my composition to be gigantic, or I want it to be just a single story, right? So they have some stake in location. Um, so that we need to consider as well. So given that, this mural, we're gonna look at two where I know the placement of the mural and how they play out in their location. This is one of them, and Leon Kier is the other one. We're gonna watch, we're gonna go see him the third visit. The third visit, um, speaking to the students. Hi. Um, so when you're on the street, when you're on 4th Street, when we get down to 4th Street to go look at Lauren's mural, which will be second, right after this, we're gonna look back up at this and I want you all to see what you see from the street. That is really important for the artist as well. And here's why I'm gonna say that. Does these, do these hands, when we talk about things like balance, movement, um, I'm gonna bring that up tonight. We've already talked about the meaning behind it, right? I'm not gonna get into too many details about that. That's for you to remember when you're writing or put in your own personal experience if you have that when you're writing. But when an artist wants us to see something, location is really important. This mural here, we see from the street. Not everybody is gonna come up here. You're only coming up here if you have business here, right? But he wants it to be visible from the street. That's why the hands, look at the placement of the hands. If he were to put the hands way over to the left, you wouldn't see them at all from the street. So what you're getting from the street is that message. Remember we talked about that in class, like when you have your two hands coming together like this, the terms we came up with that you all came up with was, was safety, was security, right, was protection. All of those is this gesture. Hands have a lot of gesture. We know letting your fingers do the walking. Um, we know what this represents, right? We know what the middle finger represents. Hands have a lot of discussion where people are shaking hands. Are they shaking hands like this? This is like a really big, tight bond, right? If, if you shake hands with someone like this versus like this, which is like a sign of business, right? So there are different, different narratives for hands. And so that's what he does as an artist. He tells stories using hands as his subject matter, okay? So the bond, two hands clasped together. There are a lot of technical things in here that we're not gonna get into, but if you were an artist, we would get into all that. So we don't need to do that here. But for sake of what we're looking at, this represents protection, right? Safety. And then you've got that little hand up there. Remember? Does anyone remember what that little hand may be, may be doing in that, those big hands? Those adult hands? Who remembers from our like pulling away or leaving it? Wasn't it like pulling away or leaving the hand? Right, right. So you're, yeah, you're on the right track. So the, the fingers are there because that, that hand belongs to this child, correct? So those fingers are there, these adult hands are here, and we see that those two center fingers are gripping the finger really, really tightly, so tightly that it is squeezing it, and it's squeezing it so hard that it's starting to turn blue underneath it, right? The artist did that, he put that little pop of blue under there that you're not gonna really see from the street, but if you make your way up here because you're curious, you might question what that means. And because we know what happens when we squeeze a body part, because we live with our hands, we know that if you squeeze it, it it's gonna turn blue, right? It's gonna lose circulation, it's gonna turn blue. So that is that first indication. So we can tell that this child is squeezing really, really hard. But then we look at that pinky that's lifting, right? Artists will put in a sense of movement because remember, they have to tell a story with a still image and get you to get it like that. And when they're propping it, it's, a, it's an important message that we need to pay attention to. And that by that pinky lifting, that gesture of that pinky lifting, that signifies that this kid is in the process of being pulled away from that adult. And that is why he's holding so tight. Or she, it's, a, it's the, we don't know the gender of this child. That's up to you. We don't know the gender of the, of the 
uh, adult hands either. That's up to you. We can tell the adult hands are hard working. Look at the look at the fingernails. Right? They're not manicured. We can tell that that's a hard working adult. There's also um, you know, it's same with the child's hand. Look at look at the fingernails. So we can tell a, a lot about these people just by looking at their fingers. But we again, we don't know the gender of the child. But we can look at the eye of the child and we can see a sense of and then you fill in what you feel, what you see. Do you see concern? Do you see fear? What do you see in that child's eyes, right? Other than, fun fact, there's a reflection of the structures that are over here, the geometric shapes are in the eyesight and the eyeball of the child. That's another thing, artists will take elements from the area and they'll implement it into their artwork. When we go to the, another mural, oh, it's something completely different. And that's something that he's bringing in elements of what this kid is looking at right into as a reflection into the eyeball. Also, the light source. Look at on top of the fingers. Look at on top of the child's fingers. When you're writing, you're gonna see a series of questions on these handouts and one of them is gonna ask you, where do you see the light source? Where do you see line? Where do you see movement? All of that are, are meant to just kind of stir up a little bit of um, intrigue when you're writing your paper. And then you're gonna look at the image, you're gonna, you're gonna take photos tonight, and then you're gonna zoom in, and you're gonna really look at it. Where do you see that? And then you're going to write it out. And as you're writing it out, your reader is going to get a clearer and clearer and clearer understanding and a picture of what you're putting in words that you're visually looking at. Okay, it's not easy to do, but you're all going to learn to do that. And then you're going to switch your majors to art history, because we need more art historians. Just kidding. It's really tough to be an art historian. So that's what we have going on. Okay, so we've got light source. When an artist is out painting their murals, the sun is up, the sun, the sun goes down. The sun rises over there by, by noon. It's right about up here. He's up here on a boom. He's painting. The sun is hitting that wall. He's going to take that moment, and that's going to be his light source. All of that is organic. You can sketch things out on before you hit your wall all you want, just to get an idea of what you're going to do. But when you get into details and the nuances of it and the reflections, that happens in real time as they're here. So light source, when we go to Leon Kears, you're going to see that the light source is on the, on the opposite. So it's on the same side of the wall but his wall is facing this direction. So you can see that it's the same sun out at the same time, and they're both putting it into their artwork. It's really fascinating. So the light source is up there. So when you're describing it, you can describe where the tone gets lighter as if it's like, the term we use in the art world is hot. Like it's really hot right here because there's a lot of intense light hitting a certain area. And so that is a light source. And then it creates what we call chiaroscuro. You don't need to know that, but if you wanted to become an art historian, chiaroscuro is an Italian term that, that means light and dark. So it's a transition between light and dark. And so if we're looking, if we're analyzing a, a, a picture, we'll say and there's some intense chiaroscuro at the top of the child's thumb and index knuckle that is hitting a little bit on the shirt of the adult in the, ba in the background, right? That's where the background comes in foreground, middle ground, background. All of that does is help you to write about it, okay? And when you're looking at images and you don't have to write about it, you can ask yourself these questions. What do I see in the foreground, middle ground, and background? Where is the light source? Is it balanced? And that we hadn't gotten, we, we've not gotten there on this one. Is this one balanced? Is it symmetrical? Is there equal weight on the left and the right side? Does anyone have a guess? Um, I would say no, because the hands are taking a space part of the of the painting, and I feel like the, um, the kid is like the foreground, so it's not balanced at all. It's more like right. And so the weight is over to this side, right? Yeah. Because it has to be visible from the street. So everything is shifted over. So when you're writing about that. And, you're, and you see the prompt, 
where do you see balance, that's when you can have that conversation. A couple of sentences like that will add to your paper. You know, a couple of sentences about light source, a couple of sentences about the fingernails or the position of the hands and what it means. And what, I'll, what that'll do is it might trigger some memory of when that was happening. Because here's the other important part. As an educator and as a lover of this art festival that we have in Long Beach that we've had since 2015 and the artists that have come here, I will always teach these murals and I will always talk about these murals and what that means is I will always remind everybody what happened in 2018 with the kids at the border. And I know it's still happening today and there's still a lot of work to be done around that, but it was really prevalent at that period. And so I get to keep that narrative and that I get to keep those kids' experiences and those parents' experiences important, relevant. And, and that's why artists do that. They want this to live here forever. You know, when you come and see this 100 years from now, that's when we looked at Kobe Bryant. It's like, we all know what's going on in the Kobe Bryant murals, but 100 years from now, we may not, right? And same thing here. 100 years from now, somebody sees this, it gets uncovered because the earth is built up way up there by then, or we're not even here, we're just up in space hovering around. Well, we're not even here, but those that are, right, they're whatever. They discover this doing something, digging for, I don't know, building a resort and they do digging and they find it, what would they think? Now they're gonna like, let's tell the story of Long Beach with this mural. That's what happens when we start telling stories of, it, of, it, of an area by their artwork. We have to look at the bigger picture. So these artists are global and they, they talk about global issues and they represent that in their artwork, okay? So we start with the date, 2018, there's the signature LB for Long Beach. So when you photograph this, I want you to photograph the signature. I want you to photograph the entire wall before it gets too dark. And then what we're gonna do, oh, the other place where there's movement, I have to finish, is uh, in the sweater. You see the sleeve of the sweater, how it's starting to flip over like this? What that implies is that the, is that the child is moving and has brushed up against that adult moving the sweater. Those are moments that are, this case has taken to show, to represent action, okay? So the sweater and that pinky, that's the two areas, those are the two areas where we see movement happening, putting a story to this. Um, and then it's not balanced, it's heavily weighted to one side, reason being so people can see it from the street, be intrigued and come up here and look at it. Okay? So does anyone have any questions, comments, or concerns? Whose work is this? Huh? Who's the artist? Case. C A S E. Case for claim. That's hard to read. Yeah. I, I see it's, it graf it's graffiti. It's graffiti art. So a lot of the artists that paint murals on walls started their careers as graffiti artists, and they just became very, very popular at it, and so and and heavily skilled it, with graffiti art. You know, many of them are self-taught. Many of them have figured out ways to do underpainting so that they can represent something realistic like this, right? So. What was it drawn with? Huh? What was it uh, painted with? Say again? What was the material that the artist Oh, thank you for asking that. So the material for this one, when we are talking about artwork, if it's an oil painting on a on a canvas, the way we'll the way you'll see it on the label is listed oil on canvas. When we're talking about a mural, the on and and the whatever it's the, the whatever it's painted on is always going to be wall. So in this case, it's it's um, acrylic on wall. But you can also put because this is brush paint. It's not house paint, but it is brush paint. Um, it's acrylic brush paint by Blick, so you don't need to get all those details. So I would just say acrylic on wall for this one. But the other ones that we're gonna look at are spray paint on wall, okay? So, thanks for asking that.